Thanks, Lars, for the technical support as well as the, uh, <laughs> the good presentation. So next we have John Henshaw, a um, friend and neighbor of mine, and uh, I believe today he's going to discuss successful models for cruise ship marketing, um, collaborative cruise ship marketing between Maine and Canada. Thank you, Dana, and thank you, uh, University of Maine and the Canadian American Center, um, the Maine International Trade Center, and um, the Maine North Atlantic Development Office for having us here today. Great opportunity, I think. I do have a connection to the Canadian American Center um, back a long time ago in the late 1980s. I worked on a publication um, at the center uh, with Charlie Colgan, who uh, later became state economist and uh, it was on the subject of the um, U.S.-Canadian Free Trade Agreement, which was very controversial at the time. I remember it was kind of funny. Um, we hired a designer to design the cover of the publication, and they came back to us with an image uh, for, the, for the cover, and it was, a, it was uh, potatoes, lobsters, and um, lumber. And those were probably the three most controversial subjects of the Free Trade Agreement. <laughs> So it was kind of interesting. We settled on flags, actually, in the end. So this is Portland, Maine, on a busy ship day. Interestingly, um, that's a double ship day in, um, in St. John, New Brunswick, a very small uh, city. Uh, they have quadruple ship days sometimes. So this is a busy day for Portland. But I wanted to talk today about one of the most successful transnational um, cooperative marketing efforts we have between our two countries in an evolving industry. So the Port Authority's um, role is to uh, improve the global competitiveness of Maine businesses by um, developing, um, investing in developing and uh, maintaining um, marine and intermodal facilities for the uh, intermodal movement of people and cargo to the benefit of the state's economy. Pretty straightforward thing. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the evolution of the industry. Uh, this, these are all canard vessels. Um, and initially, um, uh, shipping of passengers specifically was a utilitarian thing. It was transportation. It was a way to move people long distances uh, by water. And, um, and canard was actually a good uh, example of how that worked. Interestingly, their vessels are actually, um, some of their older vessels uh, that are laid up now uh, were similar in size to modern vessels, although not in terms of uh, numbers of overall passengers. But, um, but they do represent a good um, um, case of how the uh, industry has evolved. This is early uh, 19th or early 20th century vessels at the top down to a vessel built, I think it was in around 2004. At the bottom, um, that's the Queen Victoria. And um, it, the ones at the top were uh, specifically built for uh, Atlantic crossings. And, um, and actually, even the Queen Mary, which is second from the bottom, uh, still does those tra uh, transatlantic crossings. I'm not sure whether the Victoria does or not, but the uh, Victoria looks a lot, uh, lot like modern cruise ship shipping vessels today. Interestingly, also, there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry. Uh, Cunard is now part of Carnival. Carnival is uh, the Carnival, um, I forgot what they're called now. Any, um, anyway, so the Carnival vessels, uh, Holland America, Seaborne, Cunard, um, a variety of others are all parts of that. There are sort of three principal players in the industry. So there's Carnival and there's uh, Royal Caribbean, at least principal players playing in, in this marketplace but uh, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian uh, cruise lines. So there's also been an evolution in uh, technology from relatively small ships from the 1970s to the uh, extremely large vessels that are uh, being built today. Um, they were um, initially focused um, very much on the Caribbean and the, the Med. Um, but now they've uh, evolved into something that more, more resembles small cities that are, um, go to ports all over the world. Um, so the, uh, the ship at the bottom has a, a passenger um, capacity of uh, 700. The one at the top has uh, uh, nearly 6,000. 
Uh, we're actually going to see a vessel in this region that falls between the two top two classes of vessels. That's the Freedom class and the um, Oasis class. Uh, and this is one uh, called the Quantum class, and it actually carries around 4,600 uh, passengers. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, technology in the cruise shipping industry. Um, the uh, cruise shipping industry um, has some of the most technically uh, capable vessels ever uh, built. Um, they have uh, uh, excellence in navigation systems, waste management, recycling, uh, environmental systems, and health and safety. Uh, you might um, say that that's a little surprising given that some of the uh, accidents that you see in the industry. Uh, think about the Costa Concordia, for instance, uh, or the vessels that lost power in the, in the Gulf. Uh, the, I think they were carnival vessels um, that lost power in the Gulf. But they're a little bit like the airline industry in that way. When they have a, a failure, it's pretty catastrophic and uh, spectacular. Um, but they are um, pretty rare at the same time. Oops. trying to read my notes, but <clears throat> it's hard to scroll down here. So among the things that they, uh, that they have today are advanced wastewater, uh, man, uh, wastewater treatment systems uh, that are, um, in some cases, better than what you'll find in, in uh, small cities around the, the, um, the US. Um, they have, uh, in fact, toilet to tap systems where you can actually create potable water uh, out of their uh, black, uh, black water systems and gray water systems. Um, I would remember I went on a tour, an uh, environmental tour on one of the larger vessels and, and the engineer was showing us uh, exactly how that system worked um, beginning to end. And uh, at the end there was a tap um, for water to come out. And he, I saw he carefully put his hand under the water, but he didn't drink the water, but as it turned out. Um, because cruise ships in, uh, in this region, I'm talking specifically about Canada and New England, uh, operate within um, the IMO, uh, International Maritime Organization, emissions control area. They're required to meet uh, st uh, strict emissions requirements um, and, and have had uh, seen dramatic reductions in their NOx and SOx emissions. That's nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides. I'll stop doing that in a minute. There we go. Um, ships also have uh, pretty incredible waste management uh, sy uh, systems and recycling. Um, basically, because they are small cities, they operate in an extremely small uh, space. Um, they are um, required to recycle a lot of materials and, um, and really produce as little waste as possible. I'll give one other example um, with respect to um, waste management systems. In Bar Harbor, um, there was concern, because that is a pristine harbor, as you might imagine, there was concern about um, wastewater getting into the harbor from the, from the vessels. And so they started a wastewater uh, um, monitoring uh, program and uh, monitored the water sort of consistently throughout the cruise season. And they did find some anomalies in the, in the water quality, and so they wanted to figure out what was the cause of those. Well, as it turned out, um, what they found was that um, the anomalies did not coincide with the cruise ship visits. It was actually one specific fishing vessel that was visiting uh, where the water quality anomalies were occurring, and they were able, actually able to trace it back to that particular vessel. Um, I guess the final point I wanted to make on that um, is, well, no, I actually have a couple other points. Anyway, so the other uh, thing, the cruise lines have also committed to uh, support the IMO's uh, Energy Efficient Design Index, which will require a 30 percent reduction in ship CO2 uh, emissions by 2025. Um, 
And then uh, another interesting uh, piece of this is um, Bar Harbor uh, Sea, and this is our busiest cruise ship port here in the, in the state of Maine, sees about 150,000 cruise ship passengers every year. And uh, if they were coming by car, which would be the alternative really, um, that would probably be in the neighborhood of around 75,000 cars coming in. This is a community of uh, 1,500. Um, and so, you know, that's a significant impact. So the fact that they can come in by, uh, by ship, get moved around by uh, buses, which are a little more efficient than uh, cars, uh, is probably a good thing for, that, um, for the tour in, tourism industry there. So um, this is what the uh, cruise shipping industry looks like in Maine. It's been a very um, a solidly growing uh, a good industry for the state. Uh, we've seen consistent growth over time, including throughout the, um, the Great Recession. Uh, in fact, one of the things that was appealing, I think, about uh, cruise uh, vacations during that period was that they were um, relatively inexpensive. One but you had, a, you had a pretty finite cost associated with your trip. You could literally get on a, a ship for a week for $1,000 for two people and, um, and have a perfectly nice vacation if you like cruise shipping. One of the things that this does point out, though, is um, the differences in visitation between, say, uh, Portland and Bar Harbor. So Bar Harbor is the green... Um, bars and Bar Harbor is the yellow ones. And um, oftentimes, um, ports see themselves as competing for traffic. Um, that's not really the way that the industry sees it. The industry sees uh, itineraries. They're really trying to market itineraries to passengers. And so they're looking at a variety of ports that they want to include on a, on a trip. So uh, ports aren't necessarily competing with each other. They may be competing with on, uh, different itineraries and that sort of thing. And this led us to um, found an organization in, uh, in Maine called Cruise Maine, which is a port marketing coalition of 12 ports in Maine and interestingly two ports in Canada that have clo uh, clo close proximity to Maine. Um, and uh, this has been a very successful organization in terms of uh, presenting a sort of single face to the industry. And, um, and trying to make a compelling argument about uh, stopping in multiple ports in Maine and, and ports that are appropriate to uh, the size of vessels that are looking to visit. So um, just another word on itineraries. I mean, um, as I said, uh, the cruise industry really looks at marketing itineraries to their customers. And uh, so they're going to look at things like uh, fav favorable passenger reviews, the amount of fuel that's consumed on a particular itinerary, um, and their own ship de deployment plans. But anyway, that's really what drives the, um, the decisions in that in industry. And so this affects um, our entire region in terms of how uh, ships are deployed and, um, and used in the region. And so, um, this led us to make, uh, create an informal alliance among uh, the various ports in the region. Um, another reason why this was important is the United States and Canada both have similar uh, cabotage laws which uh, govern the, um, the movement of uh, freight and passengers between ports. And uh, among the provisions of those laws are that a foreign flag vessel has to call it at a, at a uh, second country during its itinerary. And so a cruise ship originating in New York and New Jersey, for instance, needs to stop in Canada at least once during its, um, during its voyage. Similarly, a, a uh, ship originating in Quebec or Montreal um, also has to call it a foreign, uh, foreign country as part of their itinerary as well. In the case of uh, uh, Canada, sometimes that's Saint-Pierre and Miquelon which is part of France, um, but most of the time it's uh, somewhere in the U.S., oftentimes Bar Harbor or Portland. So the, uh, there are 64 uh, ports represented in this alliance, and they are uh, represented by uh, five uh, regional uh, marketing organizations, including uh, New York Cruise, uh, Cruise Port Boston, Cruise Maine, 
Cruise Atlantic Canada and Cruise the St. Lawrence. And uh, they um, meet regularly and uh, have developed um, a plan to engage the industry uh, and also to uh, market themselves as, as uh, uh, good itineraries uh, to the industry. It's guided by the, princ uh, the principle of creating and maintaining sustainable cruise industry in the, in the region. Um, the organization's goals include creating a brand for the region as a cruise destination uh, while maintaining its quality of place. It's a very important part of this because um, you want to remain a desirable place to not only for people to come to, but for people to live. It has uh, set some very specific metrics and it's been uh, exceeding those metrics annually since it was created. And then uh, finally, its goals are met through the implementation of a tactical plan they put together that includes things like uh, advertising, web marketing, that kind of thing. An example of that is um, web marketing email uh, campaigns that they uh, put out regularly to, um, to the cruise industry, to um, consumers, and then also to um, uh, people who sell tours, uh, travel agents, and that sort of thing. And then the, uh, the final thing I was going to mention is that uh, annually we have a cruise uh, Canada New England cruise symposium. Uh, this year it's in New York City. Uh, last year it was in Bar Harbor. Um, it's um, it um, uh, brings together uh, ports, federal, state, and uh, provincial officials, service providers, and then most importantly leaders in the cruise ship industry. So usually they get top executives from many of the, the cruise lines that come to these. And as I said, that'll be happening in uh, Bar Harbor in uh, New York this year. Anyway, happy to answer any questions. Thank you.